The nature of the relationship between leader and follower. The relationship between the group and the follower. This is a relationship that is rooted in the creation of and experience of trauma. A helpful way to understand this relationship is by using attachment theory and trauma theory. Attachment researchers who study both child and adult relationships call this type of relationship one of disorganized attachment. I have done a separate video on this topic. Both attachment and trauma theory look at the impact of trauma on the brain and these ideas are key to understanding the response of followers to the totalist situation. Total or absolutist ideologies reflect the totalist and all-encompassing nature of the social structures they represent. Understanding the structure of these all or nothing ideologies is a helpful and critical element in being able to determine if the underlying relationships that they represent are indeed totalist in nature. The social structures of totalism and the belief systems they exhibit enter deep into the lives of those targeted. They penetrate the most personal and tender parts of us, our hearts, the places in us that seek attachment and intimacy with others, and they penetrate our brains, the places in us that usually work to help us solve the problems of survival. They detach our higher order cognitive thinking from our sensory perceptions and emotions and leave us thus helpless to understand which way to turn to avoid danger. After 10 long and dreary years, I managed to get myself out with some other people from the group, which made it easier. And I really felt driven to understand how I'd become trapped in this thing where I was not I didn't fit the stereotype that I had in my mind of the kind of person who might get trapped in a cult. So yeah, me I, too, by the way. Yeah, and in fact, <laughs> of course, as one studies this, we learn that that stereotype is quite right. false. Right. Um, but I, so I first kind of recovered by writing that first book, and then I, you know, to cut a long story short, went on to study at the University of Minnesota, do interdisciplinary studies first, which is a very important way of getting at this topic and then I um, went to the sociology department and did a PhD but fundamentally in social psychology mm -hmm. Great. Really focused on the issue of cults and totalitarianism and, and you the, teach right you're an academic I teach um, I uh, have taught at the University of Minnesota at uh, Birkbeck in the University of London I now teach at the Mary Ward Center and I do quite a lot of lecturing and writing on the topic. I'm now involved somewhat with um, some work around radicalization, European uh, work on that. Great. Writing about that. Very important. And, and the way I look at this topic, I'm sort of calling it the second risk right now mm -hmm. uh, in my head. I do have qualifications, I think, as do you, to expound on the second risk that I think our, our world is facing, and that's that of totalitarianism okay. in all its different forms, right. uh, from very intimate personal one-on-one -on -one relationships, which I call the kind of micro level to the middle or meso level of groups, yes. and the macro level of nations and the kinds of threats and, and nations that we see, such as North Korea, that are suffocating under these totalitarian regimes and yes. the rising threats around the world that I think people are, are very familiar with and frightened about. Yes, I, I agree. So that's, uh, and then I, 
So I think it's really, really important work, and it's becoming, I think, um, noticed a little more. It's been quite a hidden field in recent years, I think. Um, and so I think people like you and I have been trying to raise the profile of this work and say, hey, we really have to understand this stuff because it's affecting so many of us. It's not just the little weird cults over here and over there. It also is very much an issue on the political stage. Yeah, I would, I would yeah. say the radicalization piece, which you mentioned, is absolutely humongous. Uh, and, and for me, the, the, the key angle in is about influence. It's, we're in the age of influence, and now with social media, digital, with gathering information about our personal preferences and such, and AI coming in, it's becoming even more uh, 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 important for people who are former members who've studied this phenomenon of what I refer to as mind control, lift and cause of thought reform, other people call it brainwashing. Brainwashing and undue influence are not just a threat from religious groups, but are concerning from the political stage too. And Dr. Stein prefers to use the word brainwashing as many understand that term. She agrees with the brainwashing hypothesis of Benjamin Zablocki, with her focus being on the category of totalist organizations, of any size from totalitarian to cult to relationships. Her work, greatly influenced by Robert J. Lifton, deals with what these types of relationships and organizations look like, along with how they operate. Dr. Stein goes into detail about the evolutionary-based attachment theory, which looks at the physiology of how dynamic assault leniency can affect cortisol levels, affecting processing in the brain. With the constant high cortisol levels and no way out, a person can dissociate under these conditions. They, these um, leaders create these isolating closed structures that principally are isolating, where they cut people off from any other attachment relationships, any trusting relationships even within the group. And the only, they, the whole drive is to get everyone to attach and see as their primary sort of love or attachment figure as being the leader for right. the cause you know it can it doesn't have to be exactly the leader it's a little more abstract than that you know in my group i didn't even know who the leader was but i was right. like the group was the primary loyalty right and the ideology i guess is also totalistic right and then the ideology sort of supports that structure and the role of the leader mm -hmm. um and then there's a process of brainwashing, which is what Ben Zablocki, who's a very good scholar in this field, calls the alternation of assault and leniency. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a battering relationship. You know, darling, I love you, but boom. And then, oh, I'm sorry, did I hit you? But I really love you, boom. You know, that kind of... Yeah, good cop, bad cop. Yeah. Uh, you interrogate people. Yeah, exactly. And that's the same dynamic. And it's a highly disorienting, disorganizing dynamic, which leads to things that we know about, like Stockholm Syndrome, mm -hmm. where you start identifying with the captor. And, but you can only do that if you isolate people, because if they had somewhere else, you know, if they could go find someone else to look after, comfort them, they would be out of the, di the dynamic. So I think, to me, isolation is really fundamental in this. Right, and... and um... The, the, the cutting off of family and friends is often ideological where, where uh, people have the illusion of choice that they're choosing not to, 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 to read the papers, to talk to their friends because they are satanic or because they are part of the bourgeoisie or whatever. Exactly. And it's holding back their development to be this pure, transformed person, right? Who's right. Yeah, so, you know, we yeah. see these kind of dynamics across this range of, of phenomena. And um, I use what's called attachment theory, which is an evolutionary-based theory, to look in a, 
in a way, go down to the physiology of how that dynamic, that assault leniency thing affects our cortisol levels and then how that affects our processing in the brain where we, when we've got constant high cortisol and no way out, we, st we can dissociate under those conditions. Right, cortisol is, is generated from high stress conditions. Right. Right. And, and then we get into what's called a kind of a trauma bond. So if we're in this kind of situation of chronic relational trauma in this relationship with whoever it is, mm -hmm. we can't, we dissociate, which to my mind simply means we can't think about our feelings. Mm -hmm. So there's, and we kind of know this is going on in the brain where the higher order thinking gets, stops being connected to our mid-range brain that has all the emotional processing. And I think what happens in these kind of systems is when that gets kind of split apart by this trauma response, now the group or the leader can kind of come into the gap. Mm -hmm. Say, well, you can't think about your feelings but we can tell you what you're feeling and why mm -hmm. and therefore kindly put on the suicide vest and all will be well, you know, or whatever the messages are and you get further dissociated. So in a very brief <laughs> few minutes, right. that's kind of how I'm looking at this stuff. No, I think we were exactly on the same page. I talk about the dual identity, me before the Moonies, me in the Moonies, and the me in the Moonies would never, you know, could only think bad things about my childhood and my family and my friends and the outside world because they were all evil. And I had the true parents and, you know, that connection. And I was very much doing thought stopping against any positive thoughts about the outside world or negative thoughts about Moon, the doctrine or the group. Um, and uh, in fact, the DSM-5, the American Psychiatric Association, categorizes brainwashing under a dissociative disorder. Yeah, I think, exactly. I think that's right. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, it's interesting just, for instance, you're talking about the true parents, how many of these groups use that kind of language? It's like, yes. forget your own family. You know, Pol Pot in Cambodia and the terrible genocide there, he was brother number one. Yes. Yeah, you know, he wasn't commander, Pot. He was your brother, right? And you see this kind of language, you know, really uh, frequently. You were, uh, before we were recording, you were referring to the fantastic book by Jeff Charlotte, The Family. And yes. And his brilliant book, Sea Street. Yes. It's really important, important books for understanding what's happening right now in the U.S. But, you know, he's talking about this group in Washington, D.C. called The Family. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it wasn't called, you know, we're a political pressure group. Um, no, it's. Well, the Moonies were called the family, too. And uh, so many God, other cults. Of course, were called the family. Right. Um, you know, so we see this language over and again. And there's a reason it's because they want your primary attachment to be to them. Right. So that you're putting your own survival interests are not on the table, only the, those of the group. Right. And it's also, and importantly, it's isolating you from your actual friends or family. Exactly. So it would be a way out of the dissociative trauma bond that's going right. on. Right. Exactly. Also, there is the trauma bond created from these types of relationships, which creates thought stopping and blocks the brain from emotional processing, allows a group or leader to manipulate the actions and behaviors of others, even to the extreme such as with a suicide bomber. The group or leader wants to have the primary attachment of the person to be for the interests of the group and not of the individual. This leads to further isolation from friends and family. We all experienced the chronic terror and powerlessness of living in closed environments where the leader's control was absolute and where the group dictated often 
the most mundane details of daily life. Wrenching ourselves out of these systems, we count as among the most difficult and bravest acts we have each had to do. After getting out, we have all tried to contribute in some way to helping others. Either by helping people get out and recover from cults or by trying to educate the public to prevent others from recruitment into such groups. These cults and totalitarian systems take control over people's lives to such an extreme extent that life itself ceases to belong to followers. My colleagues and I share the experience of having been indoctrinated, having been put through the fear-driven process of brainwashing, where we have been, at least for some period of time, trapped by a psychopathic leader, locked in by a psychological trauma bond, something that we all understand. There was a burning question, though, that would not leave me, and that was, how did this happen to me? And in fact, what did happen to my brain? Because something did. My guest is Steve Hassan. He is a licensed mental health counselor who has written on the subject of cults and published three books through his Freedom of Mind Press. One of those books is Combating Cult Mind Control, which is an excellent breakdown of how destructive cults work, what undue influence is, how to recover from a cult experience, and what family and friends can do for their loved ones who may be stuck in a cult situation. I have recommended this book many times on my channel, and I really can't give it enough praise. Steve is a former cult member himself, having been involved with the Unification Church, which most of you probably know as the Moonies. Uh, he was with that for two years in the 1970s. Now, he and I have known each other for a couple of years, but it's been a bit of a ships-in-the-night situation trying to get him on my podcast. We first met at the Toronto Getting Clear conference and had a great time doing some presentations about Scientology and some of the mechanisms it uses to gain mental and emotional control of its members. In this interview, I wanted to talk to Steve about destructive cults in general and how the mind control mechanisms work. So... Without further ado, here's Steve. Consciously, I didn't, uh, but I wanted to prove to everybody, especially my parents, that I wasn't brainwashed and that I knew what I was doing and I knew all this negative information by these ex-members. Uh, and fortunately, within a few days, my mind started opening up and I started realizing that Moon was a liar, that the group was making claims that were not true, and I broke down in tears going, what have I spent the last two and a half years doing and all the people I had recruited. And I started reading and Lifton was used in my intervention, Thought Reform in the Psychology of Totalism. I sought him out and met with him and told him about the boonies. There's a funny quick story I'll tell you. I, I, I reached him, he was at Yale at the time. And uh, I sa he said, what do you want to talk to me about? I said, thought reform and the psychology of totalism. He said, that old book? This is a really great book. The major problems of our era, that of the psychology and the ethics of directed attempts at changing human beings. For despite the vicissitudes of brainwashing, the process which gave rise to the name is very much a reality. The official Chinese communist program of Su Xiang Kai Zhao, variously translated as ideological remolding, ideological reform, or as we shall refer to it here, thought reform, has in fact emerged as one of the most powerful efforts at human manipulation ever undertaken. To be sure, such a program is by no means completely new. Imposed dogmas, 
inquisitions and mass conversion movements have existed in every country and during every historical epoch. But the Chinese communists have brought to theirs a more organized, comprehensive and deliberate, a more total character, as well as a unique blend of energetic and ingenious psychological techniques. There is the more responsible, even tortured self-examination, which leads professional people to ask whether they, in their own activities, might not be guilty of brainwashing. Educators about their teaching, psychiatrists about their training and their psychotherapy, theologians about their own reform methods, opponents of these activities without any such agonizing scrutiny can more glibly claim that they are nothing but brainwashing. Others have seen brainwashing in American advertising, in large corporation training programs, in private preparatory schools and in congressional investigations. The concept of brainwashing seems to arouse in everyone its aura of fear and mystery has been more conductive to polemic than to understanding. Still, the vital questions continue to be asked. Can a man be made to change his beliefs? If a change does occur, how long will it last? How do the Chinese communists obtain these strange confessions? Do people believe their own confessions, even when false? How successful is thought reform? Do Westerners and Chinese react differently to it? Is there any defense against it? Is it related to psychotherapy, to religious conversion? Have the Chinese discovered new and obscure techniques? What has all this to do with Soviet Russia and international communism? With Chinese culture, how is it related to other mass movements or inquisitions, religious or political? What are the implications for education, for psychiatric and psychoanalytic training and practice, for religion? How can we recognize parallels to thought reform within our own culture? Their environment did not permit any sidestepping. They were forced to participate, drawn into the forces around them, until they themselves began to feel the need to confess and to reform. This penetration by the psychological forces of the environment into the inner emotions of the individual person is perhaps the outstanding psychiatric fact of thought reform. The milieu brings to bear upon the prisoner a series of overwhelming pressures, at the same time allowing only a very limited set of alternatives for adapting to them. In the interplay between person and environment, a sequence of steps or operations of combinations of manipulation and response takes place. All of these steps revolve around two policies and two demands, the fluctuation between assault and leniency, and the requirements of confession and re-education. The physical and emotional assaults bring about the symbolic death, leniency and the developing confession are the bridge between death and rebirth. 
the re-education process along with the final confession create the rebirth experience. As the reformers encourage a prisoner's negative identity to enlarge and luxuriate, the prisoner becomes ready to doubt the more affirmative self-image. Diligent priest, considerate healer, tolerant teacher, and so on, which he had previously looked upon as his true identity. He finds an ever-expanding part of himself falling into dishonor in his own eyes. At this point, the prisoner faces the most dangerous part of thought reform. He experiences guilt and shame much more profound and much more threatening to his inner integrity than any experienced in relation to previous psychological steps. He is confronted with his human limitations, with the contrast between what he is and what he would be. His emotion may be called true or genuine guilt, or true shame, or existential guilt, to distinguish it from the less profound and more synthetic forms of inner experience. He undergoes a self-exposure which is on the border of guilt and shame. Under attack is the deepest meaning of his entire life, the morality of his relationship to mankind. Not only did making these accusations increase their feelings of guilt and shame, it put them in the position subverting the structures of their own lives. They were, in effect, being made to renounce the people, the organizations and the standards of behavior which had formed the matrix of their previous existence. They were being forced to betray, not so much their friends and colleagues as a vital core of themselves. This self-betrayal was extended through the pressures to accept help and in turn help others. Within the bizarre morality of the prison environment, the prisoner finds himself, almost without realizing it, violating many of his most sacred personal ethics and behavioral standards. The message of guilt which they received was both existential, you are guilty, and psychologically demanding, you must learn to feel guilty. As this individual guilt potential was tapped, both men had no choice but to experience, first unconsciously and then consciously, a sense of evil. Both became so permeated by the atmosphere of guilt that External criminal accusations became merged with subjective feelings of sinfulness, of having done wrong, feelings of resentment, which in such a situation could have been a source of strength, were short-lived. They gave way to the gradual feeling that the punishment was deserved, that more was to be expected. This is precisely the kind of systematic rationale which the communists, through their ideology, supply. A prisoner's inconsistency and evil doings are related to historical forces, political happenings and economic trends. Thus, his acceptance of his negative identity and the learning of communist doctrine become inseparable, one completely dependent upon the other. The realignment of affirmation and negation within one's identity requires an endless repetition, a continuous application of self to the doctrine, and indeed, 
This is the essence of re-education. The prisoner must, like a man under special psychological treatment, analyze the causes of his deficiencies, work through his resistances or thought problems until he thinks and feels in terms of the doctrinal truths to which all of life is reduced. In the process, he may be guided by a particular instructor, sometimes referred to as analyst or case analyst, who has special charge of his case, keeps all personal records and conducts many individual interviews with him. The prisoner's psychological strengths and weaknesses become well known to his personal instructor, then to other officials as well, and are effectively utilized in the undermining process. What we have said so far of re-education hardly lives up to the name. We have talked more of breakdown. What impressed me most about the material was its immediacy. Just a matter of days from their reform ordeal, these men and women still carried with them its entire atmosphere. They had not yet had time to place any distance between themselves and their experiences, or to initiate the distorting reconstructions which eventually occur after any stress situation. I was to appreciate this immediacy more fully after I encountered such reconstructions during follow-up visits, with many of them in Europe and America three or four years later. The freshness of the data was tremendously helpful in conveying the actual emotional currents of thought reform. Yeah, for me that's the same. Like, after almost 10 years, it's very different from where I was right after I left the cult. You change a lot and you go through a lot of cleansing and you remove layer after layer of programming. It helped me a lot. And then <laughs> you said, why? And I said, because I just left the group. Like, kind of like you said, I read your book, Steve, and it really helped me a lot to yeah. get a handle on what, what happened to me. So I said that to him, and he said, okay, come and, come and see me. So I'm uh, sitting in his penthouse apartment, and there's a wall of hardcover books from the floor to the ceiling. And he had an ascot on as, you know, a Yale psychiatrist with, you know, the white hair thing. And I'm explaining how I we were we would recruit people and my, the, the introductory lectures and the three-day workshops and the seven-day workshops and the 21-day workshops. And he went, you know, I just studied this secondhand, but you've lived it. They did it to you, and you did it to other people. So you should really study psychology and explain it to people like me. And I was like, I was a college dropout, <laughs> depressed, embarrassed, you know, as in this Mooney cult, weirdo cult thing that was supporting Nixon during Watergate and all kinds of other creepy things. And here this Yale psychiatrist who was the eminent expert on brainwashing was saying I had something of value to share yeah. with people. So he, he did what was known in the mental health business as a therapeutic reframe. He, he said, it's like you take le lemons and you make lemonade. It's like, well, this bad, this bad thing happened, but you can use it to help people. And I was like, maybe I should go back to college and study psychology instead of creative writing. And so now you're talking to me and it's 40 plus years later. Wow. And yeah. It's, yeah. You it's have been done. an interesting life, I can tell you. I, I, well, for sure. And, and absolutely fascinating some of the things that you have experienced since then. And 
I, um, you know, it's interesting listening just even to some of the bits of your story about, you know, even as a captive audience member at the time, you, you know, during your intervention, it took them days to get a result on you. Right. And this is what I was fanatical. I was actually held up by Moon himself as the model member. I was literally like trained to like dive on a on a knife or, you know, take a bullet for Moon or, you know, kill if need be to some to advance the group. And uh, yeah, so. I, I remember I, now. So I, I was raised as a conservative Jew in my childhood, and I remember on the fourth day, as they were the, the programmers, uh, one's a psychiatrist now, one's a social worker. I should add, uh, were making analogies with Adolf Hitler and Sun Myung Moon, and I said, I don't care if Moon is like Hitler. I've chosen to follow him, and I'll follow him to the end. And I meant it. <laughs> wow and that you know and, yeah there's a conservative jew background yeah i was educated about the holocaust and i'm saying i don't care right. i don't care i i'm in this i'm doing this forever and no matter what you say it doesn't matter this kind of thought stopping this kind of complete uh obedience and and the devoted loyalty to the group um so and that's partly why i do the work that i do because i was so far gone Mm -hmm. i know that if my family didn't rescue me uh, i could still be there today and i'm also not intimidated by the most fanatical cult members (laughs) because as insane you know sea org people are it's like i i got that one i know that totally and we did the eyeball staring thing too, so. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, people don't get, you know, that these techniques that these cults use are are almost universal in so many ways. There are so many commonalities between them. And, it's, and it was for me a real point of relief when I realized that, that there wasn't anything super, super unique and special about Scientology's core techniques and they're, they're you know there's sort of as i used to put it there's a uh, cult leader playbook that these guys have you know just about they might as well have a, a playbook that they use with with all the various methods well, a lot and of techniques. them were in cults like sun man moon was in a cult and yeah. Hubbard was in a cult and then they have people leaving a cult joining their cult and saying right. hey when we were in our group we did it this way and then so they're right. learning and all this cross-pollination happens so right exactly it definitely is the universal it helped me a lot to meet an ex-scientologist and hear about how weird it was and to yeah. meet a Hare krishna and the children of god person and the more more groups i learned about the the less special you know the Moonies were. That's right. And um, I did. I did this mental technique that I share with my clients that I'd like to share with you. Yeah. Of kind of like changing the inner picture that I had as a devotee, because I would often kneel at his feet, looking up at this big guy. So it was this big looking up, and just kind of like making the picture of him really, really small and putting him on the wall next to Hitler's picture and Hubbard's picture and all the other cult leaders' picture so that when I think of Moon, he's just one of many right? instead of this great man. No, he's not a great man. He's just one of many very disturbed human beings. Exactly. That's a really good exercise. I have to say I've done something similar with Hubbard. Uh, in that regard is and, and learning about them as individuals, you know, when you come out of this group uh, and you start learning about, you know, not just, you know, that he lied, you know, like Hubbard, for example, not just that he lied about his grades or lied about university or lied about this or lied about that, but, but learning about him as an individual really does reduce him from this deity status to a normal guy and you go, wow, and then you hear stories from people from the 50s who are like, oh yeah, I didn't like him at all. And you're like, right. wow, really? You know, and it kind of it makes him much, much, much more human and it, 
and it makes the whole experience exactly you know, one thing that I cults share some basic characteristics a typical cult requires a high level of commitment from its members and maintains a strict hierarchy separating unsuspecting supporters and recruits from the inner workings it claims to provide answers to life's biggest questions through its doctrine along with the required recipe for change that shapes a new member into a true believer and most importantly it uses both formal and informal systems of influence and control to keep members obedient with little tolerance for internal disagreement or external scrutiny i'm titling this cult undue influence cults and predators and the terminology of undue influence is really a legal term uh, for somebody exploiting somebody else and uh, there are destructive cults but then they're also controlling people basically i was gonna i was a poet and i was going to be an english professor but i was deceptively recruited at, at college by three women who flirted with me and i thought they were interested but they were recruiters for a cult and at the point that i woke up and understood brainwashing it was going on in the moonies I've been totally passionate about wanting to learn everything I could about the psychology of influence and help as many people as I can to understand this phenomenon. They, they control people's behavior, they, they control their information, their thinking, their emotions. They create a new false identity out of child parts, essentially, and they make them into uh, weapons and terrorists, unfortunately. Can you tell a little bit about the steps, how many hours, how many days it's, uh, you are needing to bring somebody in this way in? So it really becomes an issue of evaluating individual cases because people are going in and out of vulnerable moments in their life anyway. Uh, so death of a loved one, illness, graduation, losing a job, moving to a new city, state, or country are all situational vulnerabilities that cults like to prey on people during those moments. Of course, with the refugee crisis, people are especially susceptible to some authoritative uh, message uh, that speaks to their needs, their deepest needs of self-worth, of meaning-making, of community-building, of hope for the future and if there's no hope immediately in in their temporal future the uh, cults like isis sell paradise so to answer your question uh recruitment can be as fast as within a few hours if someone is in a frame of mind of more receptivity or susceptibility so for example in my work of the last four decades I've met many people, uh, work with many people to help them come out where I asked them what was going on just before this group entered your life. And if they say, oh, I was praying that God should show me what to do with my life. And then knock, knock. Someone says, can we share the Bible with you? They think it's an answer to their prayer. The point is that people need to be encouraged to understand the continuum and there's an influence continuum of healthy ethical influence and un unethical influence and i have a model called the bite model that can lay out specific behaviors for people to understand that if someone is telling you you can't talk to ex-members or critics they're trying to exercise information control or if a group is telling you that if you question the leader or the group, evil things will happen, that's phobia indoctrination. That's a form of emotional mind control technique.